Now, what we're going to do is we read Philippians chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 12 through 18. But like I told you, a common theme that's going to track all through these messages is the, the idea that was expressed earlier in last week's passages, which is this. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Now, in this section, we're going to look at what Paul teaches, but it, 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 it's pretty uh, clear from the surface reading what Paul's communicating. What I think is more important here, even than the details of what Paul is, quote, teaching in this letter, is what Paul is modeling. What Paul is modeling for the Philippians, and now, because we are reading this, uh, this letter a, a couple millennia afterwards, Paul is modeling something, and what he's modeling is an attitude that I have observed in most um, healthy people of faith. When people have a spirituality that lends to their, their, their mental uh, and spiritual health, they all in common seem to have this attitude. And it's an attitude that goes throughout various stories in the Old Testament as well as heroes in the New Testament. And I will even say this attitude is not limited to Christianity. I mean, there are people who are spiritually healthy in other religions. And if you listen to their interviews or, 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 or familiarize yourself with them, you'll say, wait a second, that's, that's a Christian theme. This, this is a theme that, that I follow as a, a, that I acknowledge as a follower of Jesus. And so there's some commonality. This particular attitude that you see gets worked into the lives of people that take their spiritual health seriously. And we're going to take a look at that attitude as we go through here. And it's very simple. It's just the belief that God is using everything. N nothing is wasted. My good character development and my righteous choices, my sinful choices, and my heartache, nothing is wasted in the hands of a God who's writing out redemption throughout my life and yours. And so we'll see how this is, is modeled here from Paul. So let's, let's take a look at this and let's read through this section together. It's chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters... That what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. A little review from last week. What has happened to him? Ah, very good. He's in prison. Uh, there's some de debate on, on, on where. I won't bore you with any of that. You've got the Google as much as I do. But uh, upon reading a few articles and, and a few commentaries, probably likely he's in Ephesus. He's in prison. He's writing this letter, and the tone is very different than a lot of his other epistles uh, because it seems to kind of start out as a thank you letter to the Philippians who then uh, uh, sent a financial contribution to help support Paul while he was, in fact, in prison. So what he's talking about is an undeserved desirable circumstance. Remember, Paul is an apostle and a missionary. That means one who is sent out. Literally, the one thing that you have to be able to do to be true to that job description is to be able to move about. And this is the one thing Paul cannot do. He is an apostle and a missionary that's been grounded. Now, of course, he can write letters and he takes advantage of that. That's why we have the section of our New Testament called the pastoral epistles. And so certainly he continued his work there, but that had to be incredibly frustrating for a guy who was hands-on out there moving around. You would think that there would be a moment that would be understandable to have some discouragement and some despair. And yet he writes, he writes a thank you letter whose theme is joy. And then he begins this next section with this admission. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me being imprisoned has actually advanced the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard, imperial guard, and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Now, this is really interesting because that imperial guard would have already known the gospel. Because the gospel to the imperial guard would have been Caesar is Lord. That Caesar has brought a time upon this vast empire in which there is relative peace. And that came to the empire because of Caesar. And Caesar is Lord. This is good news, not just for Rome, but this is good news for all the world because they absorb, as they absorb other cultures, they come under the umbrella of the, of the benefits and the blessings of being part of the Roman Empire. This would have been the gospel they understood. 
And the reason why Paul's gospel is so offensive is not just because it's religiously offensive, it's politically offensive. Because Paul's gospel is not Caesar is Lord and thus the world has a pseudo peace. Paul's gospel is Jesus is Lord. He has become the king of the world. And so that has stirred up a lot of discussion and the Roman Imperial Guard would have been very interested because they lived their lives as representatives of Rome's, of Rome's gospel. Caesar is Lord. They enforced the lordship of Caesar. So they would have been very interested to hear this guy going around saying, no, he's not the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the king of the world. And it was proven through his conquering of death in his resurrection. So now this discussion is going on and the imperial guard is understanding something certainly of Paul's message. But he said there's another benefit. Not only is the imperial guard aware that this is, this is me living my life in Christ. He says in verse 14, most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment. Notice what he says there. He doesn't say they became confident in spite of my imprisonment. That's not his perspective. What he sees is a really clear connection between the increased courage of his brothers and sisters and his suffering. They are intimately connected. And Paul says that, that because of my imprisonment, they, they dare to even more, they dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. And we know throughout history, this is a, da a dynamic, you know, this is, this is the martyr's inspiration that we see the suffering of others and sometimes it, rise, it rouses us out of our lethargy and apathy so that we join the work as well. And so Paul sees this connection. Verse 15, now here's the weird passage. There's a lot of interesting ink spilt over this passage. You have fun with the Google while your chili is stewing this afternoon and uh, enjoy yourselves. I'm not gonna go into all of this, but let's take a look at this fascinating passage. To be sure, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Only that in every way whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed. And in this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. He's very bold here. He's saying there are people that are speaking out the gospel, this proclamation of Christ, and they're doing it from wicked motives, and they're even doing it from the motive of wanting to cause me more suffering in prison. But guess what? I don't care. As long as it means Christ is proclaimed, then even in my suffering, even in my imprisonment, I will continue to find my joy by the fact that this gospel is going out. There's a story in the Old Testament it's not about a Christian. It's about one of the patriarchs. Of course, there aren't really any actual Christians in the Old Testament, but we've already gone over that. Uh, but lots of people have found inspiration from this story. And it's the story of a man who is, I think, the great-grandson of a pagan that was given a promise. That pagan's name was Abraham. And God gave Abraham a promise. And, and just like Paul be, believes in Philippians, that God is faithful to complete what he's promised to do, so Abraham believed the exact same thing. And he passed this expectation of blessing down from one generation to the next. And then we get to one of his great-grandsons by the name of, maybe been great or great-great. I meant to Google the genealogy of the um, patriarchs before I came up here so I'd look more impressive, but there you have it. Uh, great, but it's one of those, great or great-great. Uh, by a, a man by the name of Joseph. 
and you're probably familiar with this. Again, lots of people find inspiration from this story, even people who, who aren't necessarily people of faith, because it's a powerful story. This man named Joseph has a dream, and in that dream, it's a continuation of a promise, a promise that God gives to Joseph that is actually connected to the promise that he gave Abraham way back in the earlier parts of the book of Genesis. And when Joseph has this dream, and it seems to indicate that perhaps his mom and dad and brothers will one day be under some, in some sense, under his authority. They actually bow down to him. Those aren't the details. You can go into that later and, and take a look at that. We were just doing the Reader's Digest this morning. And so um, they're not really happy about this dream in the same way Joseph is. In fact, they're quite put out by it, and they become very jealous. And so they make a plan to get rid of Joseph. They're, uh, they're going to kill him. But instead, one of the brothers, pr brothers prevailed, and they said, let's not kill him. Let's throw him in a pit, and then we'll take his coat that daddy bought him, and uh, we'll put blood on it and tell him, this is, we, we found Joseph's coat. Uh, it, it even is in there, one of the intentions of the brothers is actually to come back later and rescue Joseph. However, human traffickers come by in the process, and they see a way to profit from the situation that Joseph is in, and so they capture him, and they sell him on into slavery. Now, at that point, he's then purchased by a man who has some power and influence, Potiphar. And during this season in Potiphar's house, Joseph hones his skills as a project manager. He, he is blessed with every project that he manages, and Potiphar uh, uh, prospers under Joseph's management. But then Joseph is sexually assaulted, and he refuses to comply. This results in a false accusation against him that he cannot defend, and he is then put in prison. And there he spends a few years in prison. And you know, who knows what all kind of characters he meets in that prison, and what kind of characters he meets in prison, but one of them are a cupbearer and a baker, and he interprets some dreams for them. One of them saying, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna be fine, Sorry, bub, sorry, buddy, you're going to die. And uh, they get out of prison. It all comes to fulfillment. And uh, Joseph is forgot about again until Pharaoh needs a dream interpreted. So through the conversations he has with his staff, Joseph, Joseph is brought before him. Joseph interprets the dream and suggests a plan for the, dream, for, for the uh, famine that's being pre predicted. And what does Pharaoh do? He makes Joseph number two in Egypt. Now, Joseph is the project manager for the entire nation of Egypt. Job specifically create the circumstances so that there's some food security whenever the famine hits. That's his job, which Joseph does very well. And in the fullness of time, both uh, Jacob and his sons, Joseph's dad, father and his brothers, they also suffer from the famine. And so they reach out to Egypt for support so that they can get some food during this famine. And this is where they come back into Joseph's, lives, Joseph's life. And there's lots of drama there, but the drama gets worked out. He moves them all to Egypt. You know, they kind of have a cul-de-sac. They have their own little thing going on in Goshen, their own neighborhood. And uh, they're prosperous and they're taken care of. And then uh, Jacob dies. Now, at this point, the brothers start to worry. They say, we're in for it now, boys. Uh, Joseph was too respectful to kill us while dad was alive. But now that dad is dead, we're goners. I mean, like I've watched the Godfather trilogy three times and some episodes of Game of Thrones. I turned it off because it was too inappropriate, but I watched enough to know how this works. And so they come up with this game and they send a message to Joseph. You know, one of your, and they don't say our father, they say one of your father's last dying request is he really hopes you'll forgive your brothers. So Joseph gathers them together, and there's that dramatic ending that is really actually quite powerful. I mean, it, it, I even feel emotional talking about it, the idea of someone laying down that many years' worth of justified resentment and actually able to embrace those who caused him harm and offer them forgiveness looks a little bit like a picture of Jesus to me. And so, but here's what, here's what Joseph says. He says, what you meant for evil... God meant for good to bring about the salvation of many. Now, when he says this, what he is saying is that there seems to be a way in which God's intention for me wasn't thwarted by your bad intention for me. 
In fact, if I ponder long about it, I can, see, I can connect the dots and see that I arrived here in many ways because of your bad intentions. And so he rests in this fact that God nonetheless worked out his good intent for Joseph. And in doing so, Joseph is articulating, not by a teaching, but he's modeling, just like Paul is modeling, this very comforting uh, ancient teaching of the Christian church, which is the providence of God. And the providence of God simply assumes this, that God lovingly intervenes in the details of our lives. Now, before we talk too much about applying this providence of God teaching, we have to understand there are problems with it. There are extremes. One extreme would say God's providence is such that basically he's so sovereign that he is the instigator of every impulse in the universe, including the choices of wicked human beings. But really, if you push them far enough, even the choice of the copperhead to choose to sleep in your shed rather than sliver off to your neighbor's house. That's hard for me, I'll be honest. I, I'm not proposing that I'm going to go into a debate and debate against that. I am just saying emotionally, I'm, that, that causes a lot of problems for me and my understanding of God. And I, I could not, with true conviction, speak that. And I certainly could not, I'm certainly not there emotionally either. Because I think that that has some implications that can end up being very harmful and toxic to people. I also think it has implications that if someone with poor intentions gets a hold of it, they justify a lot of evil in the name of the sovereignty of God. And so, can't go there. But on the other end, you're left with a universe that is capricious, hostile, and random, and arbitrary. And, and that simply leads to living a life of fear and anxiety, or trying, you kill yourself trying to control all the details and circumstances of life so that you're protected from the arbitrary nature of the cosmos. So neither of those will do. When I talk about providence, I am talking about celebrating a mystery that we can't fully understand. The problem with this other end is that it's basically a Christian fatalism that takes away all mystery. It says there is no mystery. If it happened, it's because God wanted it to happen. Well, that doesn't take faith. Now you're into certainty. And now you're moving away from, ministry, from uh, mystery, and, and now you're not living in faith other than faith in your assumptions about how the divine works. So what I am talking about is a mystery, because to me, this other way of articulating it, you would have to say it was God's desire for Joseph to be physically abused. It was God's desire and design for him to be human trafficked. It was God's desire and design for him to suffer sexual assault and false accusation, and God's desire and design to have him in prison. Here's my point. I have no idea what God intended, and I have no way of knowing, but I have a hard time aligning all those things with the heart of God. But here's why it's a mystery. God has created a universe in which he's chosen to create free agents who can act according to their desires and their will. And in so doing, that means we bump into millions of variable possibilities where our lives are impacted by the free choices of other people. So we could feel trapped in that. Either we could take that as fatalism or take that as arbitrary, or we could say this. It doesn't change God's intent for us. That he is so mysteriously, mysteriously powerful, he factors in these seemingly random decisions of all these other agents in the universe, and God is committed to working out his intent to us regardless of what happens to us. That God's loving intent can't be thwarted. That he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete, complete it. I kind of think of providence and, and, and the, the living out of God's will like a pinball game. You know... You drop the pinball in there, and it, and this, I mean, it may not be true for you. Some of you may have had a linear progression, but most of my life feels like a ping pong ball just getting bounced off of one bumper to another and sent in, sent in all these weird directions. It just seems so arbitrary and capricious. Where is God in that? God's will is the gravity that nonetheless pulls that pinball to its intended destination. And what is that intended destination? a particular vocation, a particular partner, a particular level of income? No, the revelation of 
Christ in you, the hope of glory, which leads you in to conformity to the image of his son. That is, is his intentions. And he uses all of these seemingly random or disappointing and heartbreaking realities to continue to be faithful to that will in my life of bringing me to a deeper revelation of living from the awareness of Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's divine providence. Jesus speaks of it in Luke 12 where he says, aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. Indeed, the hairs of your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Or Paul articulates it a little differently in Romans 8, verses 28 through 29a. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. God's will for your life of conforming you to the image of his son cannot be thwarted by the actions and decisions of other people, including yourself. Because God is faithful to complete what he began in you. And here's the thing, there aren't any stipulations or fine print on that. God is faithful when you're not faithful. God is faithful when the unfaithful actions of others seem to intersect with your pursuits and throw you off course. God is still faithful to complete what he has begun. And the way Paul models this is he says, look, I am suffering. I'm not pretending like I'm just going to play the Pollyanna game and find out what I can be glad about whenever I'm in prison. I, I got to quit using that reference because all of you look blank. Does anyone, do you guys not even know what I'm talking about? Oh my goodness gracious. I have officially become out of touch and irrelevant. However... I'm going to condemn you all and suggest that you, thank you, Mike, is that, that, that you take a moment to explore cinematic history and watch Haley Mills in Pollyanna. It, it has a really important lesson to teach us all. But nonetheless, then you'll understand the origins of the Glad Gang. But the point is this, Paul's not doing that. He, he's not, sorry, a little ADD kind of kicked in there and I'm, I'm bringing it back in. Um, he, he, he's not just trying to be Silly, uh, uh, like a silly, empty, naive optimism. He's thinking really hard about this. And so he is not trying to make a case of, well, you can be happy in his prison just as much as you can be around hearth and home. That, that's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is, I know that this hasn't changed God's intent. I'm fully confident in it. In fact, I'm so confident in it, I've so trained myself to expect it that now I can see it when it's happening. Because, you know, if you're convinced that God's goodness isn't present, you tend not to see it even when it's right in front of your face. But God has trained himself. He's able to see it. And what he says is, because of my suffering, because of my imprisonment, the gospel is, in, is advancing. And it's advancing because of two different groups of people. Number one, he says it's advancing because of his brothers and sisters in the faith. That when they see him in prison, they see him suffering. They're inspired to live with courage and boldness, and they begin to speak out the faith. It's as though they recognize Paul's silence has created a vacuum, and they're responsible to partner in that ministry and to fill that vacuum with the proclamation of the gospel. In that, he rejoices. But the one that really fascinates me is his rivals. Is He says these guys, his rivals, proclaim the gospel out of selfish ambition and a desire to cause Paul trouble. Now, um, it, I don't know if you've ever thought about that passage, but one of the theories that people theorize on is they actually think that these are authentic Christian missionaries that are somehow in the business of competition, missionary competition with Paul. And the explanations aren't ever real clear about how they think they're proclaiming the gospel is going to make Paul suffer. Now, maybe make Paul jealous, but to cause him suffering, it just isn't clear, and it just doesn't make sense to me, that interpretation. Uh, now, I was told uh, by my non-charismatic friends that it's the way that they tolerate us charismatic Christians, because according to them, even though we get the gospel wrong, at least Jesus is being preached. And so then I went, <laughs> so then <laughs> I went along with that for a little while, um, but that doesn't seem very fair either. I think it's more important that we look at the context. Who did Paul say was being influenced by his proclamation of the gospel? The imperial guard. 
And so it's more likely what he's talking about is that the drama and the scandal of Paul's gospel is being talked around, talked about around mugs of ale. That's what he's talking about. Is that is that as this notorious prisoner's presence grows and grows, there are more people talking about. It. Have you heard this guy in prison? Have you heard Paul? Have you heard what he's saying? This guy's actually he he doesn't even believe Caesar's Lord. He thinks some dead religious leader is Lord. And so they're talking about this, but not necessarily in a complimentary way, may, mostly in a way to talk about what a crazy person Paul is, because this would have been beneficial to them because Paul was upsetting the empire, not just spiritually but politically, by walking around saying, Caesar's not the Lord, Jesus is the Lord. And so they really probably had really bad intents. They probably were talking about Paul's gospel in order to discredit it or in order to discredit him, which, as we all know, quickly leads to not just an ideological pondering, but very specific individual slandering. And this is taking place to Paul while he's in prison and can't do anything about it. And what does he say? At least they're talking about Jesus. At least they're being forced to entertain the possibility that maybe Caesar isn't Lord of all, but maybe it's true that Jesus is Lord. Therefore, therefore, I'll rejoice even at the mocking and slander of my name as long as it gets people talking about the message. And so he yields to it and says, I rejoice in either one. Those who model a healthy faith do not necessarily believe God causes all things. And if you believe that, that's fine. We're not arguing here. I'm just offering another perspective. They don't necessarily believe God causes all things, but they do believe that he is able to use all things. He uses your scripture memorization. He uses all the hours you clocked in attending church meetings and worship services. He uses your passion for ideas and to grow in your theological apprehension of the ways of God. He uses all, he uses your good deeds in his name. He uses your involvement in soup kitchens and in the lives of the broken. He also uses your stupidity and your sin and one of the hardest ones to wrap around, when you're devastated and your heart is shattered in a hundred pieces and you're done and you don't want to move forward, in that place, God is still being faithful to complete the work he began in you. You may not always see it, but you can live in light of that truth. Now, you may ask me, okay, Artie, I'm a pretty smart guy. In fact, I've become convinced the more I've listened to you, I'm a lot smarter than you. Which I, I understand that that's how most people feel after a while. Are you sure, are you certain that you have not been too infected with your viewings of, multiple viewings of Pollyanna throughout your life? And that what you're doing is being naive. You're just trying to layer some sort of explanation to try to make yourself feel better and feel more comforted by believing that there's a reason behind it all. Are you sure that's not what you're doing? Here's my transparent, honest, pastoral answer. No, I don't. It's possible that is what I'm doing. I actually can't say with absolute certainty that that's not what I'm doing. But here's what I can say with certainty. When I choose to live my life as though this world is capricious and random and hostile, I become a man who is a cynic filled with despair and anger. And I'm so preoccupied with my own stew of existential despair that I am rarely present to love anybody else. And I'm often leveraging my relationships so that I can use the people in my life to help protect me from the capricious, arbitrary nature of this universe in which I am not safe. And I become a self-centered black hole of despair 
and I stop serving and I stop loving. I'm certain, I've seen it happen. That happens to me 100% of the time. And the way I deal with the stress of this is I immediately go through, go, I run to any kind of addictive activity that can help temporarily ease me from this despair. That's what I do. However, when I'm willing to entertain the possibility that I'm not smart enough to know everything, and that perhaps my creator is at work in levels and in ways that I can't fully understand or see, but I can look at the testimony of scripture, I can look at the testimony of other followers of Jesus, and I can look to my contemporary friends in the faith, and I can have enough emotional courage to step out and say, I don't see it, but maybe, maybe he's still at work. Maybe there's still something redemptive he can do with this broken up, wrinkled soul of mine maybe, just maybe there are miracles all around me and I just blind myself to them through my cynicism. And I begin to live a different way. And I begin to live in more open spaces. And before long, I'm inhabiting a universe that isn't hostile and mean, but it's dripping with the goodness and the kindness of God. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking, how did I miss all these miracles before? He is constantly at work all around me. And yes, there are people that have broken my heart, but you know what? God used other people to mend my heart. And I can see where God's at work. And all of a sudden, I become a person that isn't this dark pool of existential despair. Rather, I can be present with other people. And I can even be useful to say, you know, brother, you know, sister, I see God's grace at work here in this turn of events. And we can dialogue and enter into that journey together. And all of a sudden, I'm able to be present and I'm able to be loving and I'm able to serve others because knowing God cares for me invites me to live in blessed self-forgetfulness. So, no, I can't say for certain. But have I certainly made my choice? Yes, I have. And, and that's part of the reason for it. So what I want to do is I want us to come to a close here and the worship team would come forward. And we really went past very quickly to call the, the call to action last week. We went through it so quickly that I was dissatisfied all week long because of it. So they said they were going to give me a microphone again this Sunday. So we're going to go back and do it again so I, I can correct this. So let's all stand up for just a minute. So worship team comes forward. And let's just create some space here for about five minutes. If you're comfortable, I'd ask that you would close your eyes. If you're comfortable, just for the transition of your mind, I just ask you to take three good breaths just to You've been thinking with your brain, as you should, contemplating these concepts. Now I'm asking you just to take a moment to sink just a little bit deeper. Even if part of your mind still trying to sort out the implications of something I've said, just, just go, shh, 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 shh. We'll get to that later. Right now, I'll just have this space. Again, if you further feel comfortable, just as a symbolic gesture of your intent, I would ask you to take your hand and place it over your heart. And just in your own space, speak this simple prayer. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Holy Spirit, I'm not trying to get you to come. I am trying to get my brain aware of your presence. And in that place of awareness, I really want to hear from you. Now take just a moment. And I want you to remember a foolish choice that you made. Maybe even a devastating, heartbreaking choice that you made. Maybe a sinful choice that you made. Maybe the one that despite all the scriptures of no condemnation you've memorized, you feel regret and condemnation for it. Now ask God to compassionately show you what motivated you to make that choice. And if your brain just wants to say something simple like your lust or impatience, 
then say, thank you, Brain, for your contribution. I'm gonna wait on the Spirit. What was it really about? What kind of despair were you trying to escape from? What, what kind of trauma might you have been trying to forget about? What really motivated that choice? Now that you're on the other side of it, is there any part of your heart that can see how God has inserted wisdom in that process? How God has worked redemptively in that process? That God has made you become either a more compassionate person, a more patient person, a wiser person perhaps? Show us, Lord. Show us how you've been at work in our disappointments and in the choices that we regret. Let us see it so that we can enter into this space where we can trust you more fully. We have a few more moments, so I want you to remember a wise choice now. One that maybe to your surprise worked out quite well. One where you consciously chose to apply the wisdom of previous seasons of your life to this season of your life. Now ask God to show you how he directed you in that choice. Was it scripture reading? Moment of prayer? Conversation with a trusted friend? A random line from some song that was playing in the background. You see it? You see that moment where God stepped in and he invited you to pay attention to your own inner lucidity because that's where his presence is found. Confess the affirmation of your growth and wisdom that resulted from your life-giving choice. And finally, for those of you who are here this morning, who are being very polite, listening, even participating in our activities here at the end, but the truth is there's distraction in your heart. You're not at rest. You're not at peace. You're still wrestling whether or not your circumstance is arbitrary or is seasoned with compassion and grace from God. It's okay to be there. You don't have to have that resolved in a three-minute prayer exercise. So then, for those of us who are there, let's just take a moment to choose to rest and trust his process, even if it's taking longer than you expected. You're welcome here, Holy Spirit. Calm our restless hearts. Open our eyes to see your goodness. Give us the courage to trust that you work for our good, even when it's impossible to call the circumstance good. Help us to leave here really living from the reality that you who began the good work in us will, will, will be faithful to complete that work.